I like the chirping very much. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Thank you for bringing me here. I've had a wonderful weekend, and you are amazing people. I want to start just by saying that for many years as a member of the philosophy department at Oklahoma City University, I taught a course called Critical Thinking. And I introduced students to something the Greeks called syllogistic logic. And you're really all familiar with this. It's a fancy word, but you know it. It sounds like this. Major premise, all men are mortal. Minor premise, Socrates is a man. Therefore, conclusion, Socrates is mortal. Sometimes people will just drop the first or major premise, all men are mortal, because everyone assumes that it's true. Often we don't express our first premises because we assume them. And in Greek logic, any assumed first premise is called an enthymeme, spelled E-N-T-H-Y-M-E-M-E. -E -M -E. Makes a great password for your computer because nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> a more modern example would be this. Rogaine grows hair. Therefore, bald men love Rogaine. Nobody thinks to state the major premise which must be bald men would prefer to have hair because we assume it. It's an enthymeme. There are, of course, assumed premises in American politics, like wealth will trickle down. More guns will make us safer, as well as in Christianity, like Jesus came to save our souls and died to pay the price for our sins. And then, of course, there is original sin, which may be the granddaddy of all enthymemes, the most important assumed premise in the church. What I've been asking my students to do for years is to challenge their assumed premises and to see how that changes many of the arguments they take for granted. What if money does not trickle down? What if more guns do not make us safer? And in the church, what if we are not born helpless little sinners, but are, to use the title of a book by Matthew Fox, born an original blessing? This is not to say that people don't sin. Of course they do. But it's not because they can't help themselves. Perhaps we don't need to save our souls so much as we need to restore them to remember where we came from, where we're going, and to whom we belong. The church is awash in so-called developed doctrine, those first premises that are nowhere to be found in the Bible. Original sin says that we are born into sin, that we inherit it from our first parents, Adam and Eve, that we arrive in the world as little sinners, trapped by the transgressions of those who came before us because sin is a birthright, like being born with red hair or left-handed. It says that we sin because we are sinners rather than that we are sinners because we sin. That is no small distinction. Original sin renders us helpless. Original blessing says we have a choice. And you've got to hand it to the church. They provided all of humanity with a diagnosis for a disease which only the church has the cure for. You are depraved, we can get you saved, and that, my friend, would be the ultimate spiritual franchise. What's more, if you can keep the masses from challenging your assumed premises, you have enormous power. Take the divine right of kings. It enslaved humanity for centuries until someone got up one day and said, the king is not divine. The emperor has no clothes. The earth is not the center of the universe. Copernicus challenged the assumed premise of an earth-centered universe, and then Galileo made it official, and so the church put him under house arrest for being right. 
The doctrine of original sin as we understand it in the church happens to be found nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures or in the New Testament either. Of course, we have this wonderful story in Genesis in which a mythical couple, Adam and Eve, who have everything they need but not everything they want, choose to sin and then get us all kicked out of the garden. I call it a myth, not because it's not true, but because it contains a truth larger than mere facts can convey. The instructions to Adam and Eve are very clear. Do as you please, says God, but don't do one thing. Don't do this one thing. Don't eat the fruit of one tree in the middle of the garden or you will die. Nonsense, says the serpent. Go for it. It'll open your eyes and you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. Besides, if someone tells us exactly what not to do again and again, isn't that what we start to want to do? So the woman partakes, of course, because the story is written by a man. (laughs) She partakes, then she recommends it to Adam, the little temptress, and immediately they realize they are naked i.e. they discover shame. But the best part of the story is the passing of the buck. When confronted with the transgression, Adam blames the woman who blames the snake. It's the first example of the victimhood mentality where no one is ever to blame for anything at all, ever, and the epicenter of this sickness in our time, in my country, is located in Washington, (laughs) D.C. Everything is someone else's fault. The Bible is full of choices that are stories that are etiological. That is, they're written to explain how things got to be the way they are now and then placed retroactively in the record to look and sound prophetic. Those are the lens, that's the lens through which the Bible needs to be read. In movie making, we call this a prequel. The rabbis looked around at the world and it was a mess. Humans were weak and selfish and dishonest and deeply flawed creatures. But God is perfect, they said, so it can't be God's fault. So how do you write a story that gets God off the hook and places the blame squarely on rebellious humans? Well, you write a story that explains it all. Once we were perfect, God was perfect until we did exactly what we were told not to do, which is very often what we do. And what is the sentence handed down? It will be to live in the world we live in, where women give birth in great pain and sometimes die in childbirth, and men must work by the sweat of their brow in dusty fields until they die. We can can relate to this in Oklahoma. Or think of etiology this way. Myths serve to explain why, to use a Buddhist phrase, what is, is. Once we were perfect, frolicking blissfully in paradise, God's work was perfect, but because we chose to sin, we now suffer the consequences. We've been kicked out of the garden. We all live, to quote Steinbeck, east of Eden. But the story does not say that we sin because we can't help ourselves. It says we often choose to sin and suffer the consequences. This was wisdom, not doctrine until Augustine created the doctrine of original sin. Because he knew a thing or two about sinning, if you'll study up on Augustine, especially sins of the flesh. He was quite the rogue until his conversion and then went on to write about impure thoughts he was still having after becoming Bishop of Hippo. Perhaps original sin helped Augustine to deal with the decisions he had made because he just couldn't help himself. They call it original sin, which, by the way, led one stand-up comic to say, I'm all for original sin. I think if one is going to sin, one ought to be original about it. (laughs) But in fact, the doctrine of the church really makes unoriginal sinners out of all of us. We're just doing the same old, stupid, nasty stuff all the time, because we can't help ourselves. That's not very original. I saw a sign once in front of a church in Oklahoma years ago that announced the sermon title, and it read in big block letters, if you're done with sin, then come on in. 
But as I drew closer, I saw that someone had written another message just underneath it in small letters, looked like lipstick. It said, but if you're not quite through, call 272. <laughs> so what if Matthew Fox is right? What if we are born not into original sin, but as an original blessing? Here's what I believe. Over the centuries, the church has unwittingly been part of a grand ecclesiastical put-down of the human race. We have focused so much of our energy on teaching people to be humble that we've forgotten how to embrace the idea that we're born in the image of God, captured by that beautiful Latin phrase, imago dei. That is our original first premise, and it is in the Bible, Genesis 1.27. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them, I'm sorry about the male pronouns, we don't need them anymore, we could just say God. I don't think that means God has arms and legs and body hair, rather I think it means that if God is love, then we were created to love. I'll never forget the day years ago when I reported as a seventh grader to what used to be called homeroom. Do you have homeroom up here? It, it was the first day of school and you gather there and the teacher reads the role, then you get your schedule and head off to your day. It's a very important moment because it's the first time that your name gets read aloud in front of your friends and thereby your identity may be established in a critical way. And on that particular morning, the teacher read the name of a particular girl and then stopped and peered over her glasses and said, um, is so-and-so your father? Yes, the girl replied. Mm, and is so-and-so uh, your brother? Yes, ma'am. You see, both the father and the brother had served prison terms on drug charges. Then the teacher said in front of the class, well, I sure hope you're not like them. Now, how do you think that girl felt? I personally believe the teacher should have been arrested, charged with a rhetorical crime against humanity. When we project an expectation of failure, that's usually what we get. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You've heard that, it's kind of cute. It's cute, the only problem with it is it's not true. It is false. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words Words can totally destroy me. So why do we put one another down so often? Is it because we think we'll get too high an opinion of ourselves and thus become arrogant? Well, most arrogant people I know are that way because they really don't have a very high opinion of themselves. They are insecure. Or as my friend the rabbi put it, a man who does not love himself wisely and well will make a casualty out of the neighbor sooner or later. I give you Trump as Exhibit A. In fact, we so distrust our own goodness, our real birthright, which is imago dei, that the word human has now been joined with a certain given weakness or fallibility. A baseball player strikes out, not because the pitcher threw the perfect curveball, but because the batter is only human. Your grandmother who bakes the cakes, the perfect three-layer jobs that come out of the oven like a work of art and taste like sunshine in your mouth because nobody bakes them like your grandmother. But one day, something goes wrong. It happens. The cake falls, falls, as they say, flat as the sole of your shoe. And what does grandma say when she fails? Well, child, I'm only human. Well, this is what I want to know. What was she when she baked the perfect cake? <laughs> what was the baseball player when he hit the grand slam or made the diving catch? Human. We seem to want to talk about our humanness as a way of explaining failure, but not as a way of explaining success. It's original sin over original blessing again. We've all heard this. To err is human to forgive divine. See how the pie is sliced? Humans also forgive, do they not? I hope so. 
I can tell you from personal experience that most children do not start out in this world all bent over from the weight of excessive and crippling humility. I know because I helped my wife raise three children, kids don't come into the world this way. You have to drill that into them. You take, for example, a nine-year-old boy, he's just gotten an A in arithmetic from the hardest teacher in the school, and he's on his way home with this grade card in hand, and he's not a picture of humility. He says, look at that, that's an A, look at that, not a B, not a C, look at that, that's an A from old, what's her name, she doesn't give A's to anybody, I'm thinking about skipping junior high and high school, going straight to college, that's an A, baby. Now you take that same boy 30 years later, he's a civic leader, he's community minded, he's been the head of some important project. They call him forward to receive recognition for his work and what does he do? He stares at the floor, counts his shoelaces, mumbles a few words of thanks for all the forgotten people who made it possible and his grandmother who came over in a covered wagon. Ah, sometimes I just wish people would get up and say, thank you, I deserve this. In fact, this ought to be made of solid gold the way I worked on this project. A man named Edgar Lee Masters from Spoon River, Illinois, wrote a bunch of poems once and called them the Spoon River Anthology. And basically, they're all framed on one idea. The, the people in Spoon River have all died, and now that they're dead, they're telling the truth. One of them is named Constance Hadley, and this is what she said. Quote, you praised my self-sacrifice, Spoon River, for rearing Irene and Mary, orphans of my older sister, and you censured Irene and Mary's contempt of me. Don't praise my self-sacrifice, and don't censure their contempt of me. I cared for them, it's true enough, but I poisoned all my benefactions to them by constant reminders of their dependence on me. Do you know what she means? It sounds like this. As long as you girls set foot under my table, as long as you sleep under this roof, remember who took you in when your mother died. In other words, every kind word was accompanied by a reminder of the indebtedness of the recipient. Is it any wonder that the people we try to help so often end up hating us for it? When I was a boy growing up in Wichita, Kansas, I was a double PK. I'm, I was the son of a preacher and the son of a professor who became a preacher and a professor. My home church was Plymouth Congregational Church, and we had something called the Annual Christmas Project. We really didn't do a whole lot of benevolence work the rest of the year, but when Christmas came around, we were on fire, inspired by the Jesus who is the reason for the season, and putting Christ back in Christmas and all that, and a bunch of us from the youth group, we set out to spread love and joy, and we never thought for one minute we were being condescending about it. We made baskets for the poor, and then we dared to go into what we called the ghetto in those days to distribute them. And we felt good about it. In fact, we were proud as peacocks. First, we collected money somehow. I don't remember how we got the money. We probably did a car wash or a rummage sale, Maybe we embezzled from our parents. I don't know, but we, we got the money somehow, and then we called the Department of Social Services, and we asked them matter-of-factly, uh, who are the poor in this community? And they gave us a list of needy families. And we went shopping, and we, we bought fruit and candy and apples and oranges and bananas. We put them in a sack. Then we put the sack in a basket, then we tied a bow on top of it, put a little card in there with a hallmark verse about the true meaning of Christmas. Off we went. But we knew it was important to be humble because after all, the whole Christmas story is humble, the baby Jesus is humble, the manger, nothing if not humble. So this is how we did it. First, we'd go up on the front porch with the basket and knock on the door. And when we heard the person who lived in that little shack coming, we'd yell, Merry Christmas, and then we'd run and jump in the car and drive on to the next house. We didn't want to talk to anybody, just deliver the goods and feel good about ourselves. We were making deliveries, we weren't making contact. And it was my turn to make the delivery. 
And this neighborhood was downright depressing. And some of these places did not look fit for human habitation because they weren't. But I thought, well, that's why they can use some cheers. So I walked up onto this one porch and I knocked on the door. Nothing, no response. Nobody, nobody home, I guess, so I tried again. Nope, no, nobody home. I was kind of enjoying the thought. My friends were growing impatient, started honking the horn, come on, Robin. And then suddenly his face was at the door, staring at me through the screen. It was a black face and I had not seen it at first in the shadows of the evening. But all of a sudden, there he was, and he said, hi. And I said, oh, oh, hi. He said, what can I do for you? I thought to myself, "Uh uh-oh, what do I do now? I was just trying to leave a basket here, and now I'm in a conversation with a real live poor person. Then another face appeared. This face belonged to a woman, and she said, hi. And I said, "Uh, hi, and she said, won't you come in? Come in? Well, this is not working out like I planned. I mean, sure, why not? Um, And so I went in, and they introduced themselves. I'm Benjamin Johnson. And then his wife said, I'm Claire Johnson. And I thought to myself, how strange, they have names. And I must have been staring off into space because they responded to my silence by saying, and your name? Oh, I'm Robin Myers from the Plymouth Church Youth Group. Oh yes, said Claire, big church, beautiful church. And then a little boy came from another room and he looked to be about nine or 10. And his mother said, this is Timothy. And I said, hi, Timothy. And he said, what's in the basket? I'd forgotten I was even holding a basket. I I said, oh, here, Merry Christmas. I handed him the basket. He took it from me, and get this, he started getting into the basket, unwrapping the paper. He started opening the gift right there instead of waiting until I left. He took out an apple as if he intended to eat it. I'm thinking to myself, this is not working out like I planned. And then Timothy did something really weird. He got out a second apple, and get this, he handed it to me. He gave me some of my own fruit. I'm thinking to myself, stupid kid, doesn't know how charity works. He's given me back my own stuff. But what was I supposed to do? After all, I'm supposed to be humble. So I took it, I sat down, took a bite out of it, and thought to myself, well, here I am sitting in the home of real, live, poor black people with real names eating out of my own sack. But I'll never forget what I learned that day. I learned something as powerful as anything I've ever learned in my life. It shapes my theology, my politics, my family life, and my understanding of God. And it's very simple until you think about it. And then it's very dangerous. All of us, and I do mean all of us, eat out of the same basket. Not mine and yours, his and hers, ours and theirs. No more what do you people want, but what do all of us want to become? Because however we like to hide it behind slogans of the self-made man and manifest destiny, survival of the fittest and all that, the truth is we all eat out of the same basket. We all eat together. The church knows that. The world is not our project. Our opportunity to take from the poor and give to the rich and then sanctify our guilt with a little charity at Christmas time. No, we're all in this together. All of us need all of us to make it. And we've got to stop thinking of ourselves as if some are entitled and others are not. The reason we should share more of the gross production tax in Oklahoma that we get from drilling for oil and gas is that our teachers are pitifully paid and they're all leaving the state. I wanna say to oil and gas companies, what do you plan to do, eat it all by yourself? 
Did you make it all by yourself? The real message of Genesis isn't that we're infected with badness, but that God made plants and trees and vegetation of every kind and said, that's good. Then God made light, a greater to rule the day, a lesser to rule the night, and the stars, and God said, that's good. Then God filled the sea with fish, the sky with birds, and even the great sea monsters, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so, and again, God saw that it was good. Then, then God made something else. Slowly, out of the primal ooze of nothingness, God made a creature who could write poetry, paint masterpieces, and raise Lazarus from the dead with medicine as well as with faith. And after God made humankind in God's own image, it is the only time that God says not this is good, but this is very good. What God made was you and me. And if we put ourselves down, that's a sin and not a very original one. When God made you and me and Benjamin and Claire Johnson and their son Timothy and every other human being in the world, God said, this is the very best I can do. Or as the Ephesians letter puts it, you are God's masterpiece. So the next time someone does something truly extraordinary, something good and decent and grand and hopeful, just say, well, she's human. Hey, great cake, Grandma. Well, child, I'm human. Nice catch, Mr. Third Baseman. Well, I'm human. Take a look to your left right now at the person sitting to your left. Make eye contact. Okay? Now, now, now look at, to the right and make eye contact. Do you know what you're looking at? Do you know what you're looking at? Sitting next to you in this sanctuary right now, at this moment, is the image of God. And every time you live up to your inheritance instead of living down to your sickness, you are recreated in the image of God. And next time you think you can't do something, just remember, hey, I'm human. When I consider the heavens, the work of God's fingers, the moon and the stars, I think, what are persons that... You are conscious of them, women and men and girls and boys just like us, and the answer comes back clear as a bell. This I have made in my own image only slightly less than myself. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you're an original blessing? I know you know how to say amen, so if I say, let the people say, I ask Barry, I asked Barry if I could do a little switcheroo and offer the benediction, and he said, fine. He's brand new. What can he say? I I want to teach you the benediction we say every Sunday morning at Mayflower so I can leave a little bit of my church with you when I head home this afternoon. This is what we say at the end of every service. And now may the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does pass all our understanding, go with every one of you, abiding in you, lifting you up, making you whole. Go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. What I want you to do is repeat those last three words with me, every single other. When I say love one another, are you ready? And now may the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does pass all our understanding, Go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up, and making us whole. Go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. Amen.